Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing wonderfully well. Today, another interview, and this one I've been secretly looking forward to. I think this is going to be really interesting. What we've got here is AV8B Powerline Mechanic, and we've got Baron. Hello, Baron. Would you prefer the Baron or Baron? Uh, Baron is probably the go-to. Roger, thank you for contacting me. I'm going to read through your synopsis, if that's okay. Enlisted in the US Marine Corps in 2003 at the age of 18. Stationed at, U is it Yuma? Yuma. Yuma. Yep. Uh, Arizona, I'm guessing, in a B Squadron VMA 513 Nightmares in 2004 as a Powerline Mechanic. Powerline Mechanics were the plane captains in charge of the aircraft on the deck, repairing, troubleshooting, engine and fuel systems, doing general servicing and launching recovering aircraft. Deployed on the 15th MEU in 2005 aboard the USS... I never, I can never pronounce this, bon Bonhomme Richard? Question mark. Bon Bonhomme Richard. A lot of people just call it the Bunny Dick. <laughs> oh, I scared the cat. That's good. I like that. Very good. Um, stopping in Iraq. Transferred to VMA 214, the infamous Black Sheep, where I did two uh, 31st MEU deployments to Japan and being attached to the USS Essex. Sorry, what is MEU? That is a Marine Expeditionary Unit. It's basically a a fleet of you know navy mm -hmm. and marines uh who go out and we patrol areas and you know any sort of combat situations that arise that were uh i did a few humanitarian mm -hmm. situations uh yeah we basically just go out for six to eight months and float around the sea around you know korea mm -hmm. and uh some people go to the europe areas but mm -hmm. being on the west side of the u.s we always went to the west side of the globe is this uh, vessel what we call an LHA, or is it... Oh, LHD, WASP class. L LHD, yeah. So do you know how similar this is to the LHA that we get in DCS, which is the Tarawa? Sorry for the pronunciation. I want to say it, it is very similar. On the Tarawa, it's, the elevator is on the back of mm -hmm. the ship, mm -hmm. and uh, on the LHDs, there's one on the left, one on port, one on the starboard, mm -hmm. and... Uh, the back is purely for unloading landing crafts, and I, th I think they had that on the LHAs also, though. Mm -hmm. but I'm not positive. The LHA is, they is landing helicopter assault, and LHD is landing helicopter dock. Now, one thing I noticed is that you guys, <laughs> on your Harrier carriers, as I call them, never had ramps. That's right, isn't it? Whereas we always had ramps, didn't we, Auntie? Yes. I know it's a bit of a funny thing to bring up, but we might not get a better chance to, to answer. Does anyone know why that is? Well, I know uh, why we had ramps. It was um, so that the ships could be smaller and you could take heavier weights oh, right. off the deck. So the, so uh, it's developed by the Air Force, actually, the ramp. The other thing about the ramp is um, you could launch aircraft in heavy seas because it, if your your ship is going down the wave the ramp still shoots the aircraft up into the air. Mm -hmm. Whereas if, you, like, you're on an LHA and mm -hmm. you're going down a wave, your, 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 hel your aircraft is going towards the next wave. So it has to climb faster. Mm -hmm. So with the ramp, you're always shooting your aircraft into the air. Okay. I think one of the big main reasons at first was purely for the weight of takeoff. You could get more than it's uh, airborne mm -hmm. over the ramp. I was on the, in our simulator in the LHA, I am constantly worried about smashing into the sea, and I'm sure you guys are as well. It's it's horrendous going over with a heavy load, isn't it? There is a mod out there um, at the moment for the Hermes, I've got it. I think. Um, I've got it. And it, it's, it is very good, especially mm -hmm. in heavy seas. You, you find that really good. My opinion, though, we don't use the ramps is for uh, more helicopter deck space because mm -hmm. uh, they they load those LHGs up with you know Hueys, Cobras, mm -hmm. uh, 46s, 53s, and then the Harriers on the back. And uh, it's a pretty loaded ship as it is. So I bet they don't have the ramp just for the extra space. Roger. So I guess deck space in, in any carrier I, it must be a premium, you know, square footage. I'm sure you've seen our interviews before, but what they are is we, rather than me con concocting kind of biased questions, we let the valued viewers, the public, uh, give us the questions. They can be sometimes ridiculously good and sometimes terrible uh so we'll just see how it goes we prefer doing it like that one this is a good question is the sound of the harrier in real life as piercing as it is in dcs are you a dcs -er, baron i can't remember i am i'm i'm uh fairly new i just started about uh earlier this year roger one interesting anomaly we have in dcs is that the harrier for some reason out 
audio, I can't think of a word, but it's louder than everything, will cut through the sound of any other jet, and I can't imagine it would be like that in real life, But and it is really howling and piercing, but what are your thoughts on that? The, the piercing howl is quite accurate. Uh, it's, when I was in, it was probably the second loudest, most annoying aircraft in the service. Oh, really? N- number one was the EA-6B Prowler. Is is by is far that? the most uh, most loud and obnoxious engine sound. Why? N- number two was a Harrier. I've got to have a quick look at that. What was the the EH? What was it? EA six B Prowler. Oh, isn't this the? Yeah, this is the intruder the, the thing. Electronic is. warfare. Yeah. Why was that so loud then? It. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Just, Just how uh, it's designed. I had no engines, idea. Yeah. Wow. How interesting. You wouldn't have thought that, but okay, fair enough. All right, well, that's a good answer to get us kicking. Um, but I, I will, I will add uh, the the sounding game is pretty good, but it's missing a lot of, you know, uh, ah. people like to call it the the saw blade sound. As it throttles up and down, it has this distinct sound. When the I could go into the details of what happens, but there's things that move inside the engine mm-hmm. that give this unique sound. Mm-hmm. Um, is that from the outside? I'm presuming external sound. Uh, from the cockpit, uh, mainly. The cockpit. How interesting! I actually, I have a video. I don't know if, if yeah, you like send. doing. Oh jeez! It was quite loud. I hear the I hear the chainsaw thing you're talking about. Yeah. They really need that. They, they need that in game. Without that, it's. Not the same. Is that uh, is that one of your videos or is that just generic? Yeah, no, that that's my video right. that I made. Son of a gun, very lucky. Yeah, that sounds amazing. That kind of kind uh, almost kind of burt sound in the middle. That's interesting, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And one thing, one thing we forget about the Harrier because it hasn't got big, fancy, shiny afterburners is just the immense power of that engine. It really is such a. You know, it's not a supersonic aeroplane. Well, unless you do an extreme dive, it's not a supersonic aeroplane. So, you know, it doesn't seem as kind of powerful and stuff as a, a Tomcat. It's not in, you know, in gross thrust, but it, it kind of power to weight ratio. It's an absolute belter. Whenever we do our drag races, and we like doing our drag races because we just like to have fun, yeah, you know, until you get to kind of 500 knots, it's nearly the winner. It's such a powerful plane. You got, it's got so yeah. much power there. It really is quite amazing. Quite a feat, real feat of engineering, that is. What was the most maintenance-intensive part of the aircraft? Uh, the easy answer is uh, engine change. I knew this was going to come up because I, I put in my own yeah. question, but please go ahead, yeah. Yeah, uh, to change the engine, we had to uh, pull the wings off and then <sighs> pull the engine out. And With a solid crew and doing all the repairs, I mean, you're looking at like two days of wow. non-stop work. Because... When you watch an F-16 or a, uh, an F-15 engine change, it's it's not dissimilar to uh, to a car. You you disconnect the services, you disconnect the engine mounts, you put it on a big trolley or you know kind of hangar or something, and you just you just put it out. I say just, but you know it's relative, made relatively easy. But when I learned that to take a Pegasus out, you have to <laughs> you, you know you're dismantling the airframe. It's an unfortunate um, byproduct of having this design, I guess, isn't it? Yeah. Uh- I'm just looking at it now, so I see. Yeah, it's a it's it's a massive engine. It's it's basically like the A10s built around the gun. Mm-hmm. Well, the Harrier is 100% built around the engine, Literally. and uh, it's it's actually one of the first aircraft that uses a. Uh, I forgot to call it. Uh, it's it's basically like a unibody structure. It's not mm-hmm. bunch of ribs, uh, mm-hmm. aluminum ribs that are fastened together, and you can basically re- replace the tail end of a mm-hmm. I don't know CH46. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Harrier was one of the first that they used like this frame, this composite frame, and then you just have a bunch of panels throughout the aircraft. So mm-hmm. you can't really repair the body of the aircraft very well. Mm-hmm. You can't just cut off the tail and install it. So I think that 
plays a part in uh, the design of the engine and yeah, that's it's, one... it's mm -hmm. a real, mm -hmm. real engineering feat, this thing. And that's sort of news to me. I wasn't aware of that. So this sounds like it's more like a car, as in you have a car has a monocoque and you can't just, you know, unscrew the tail end. It doesn't work like that. The monocoque it, it, is, the it is... It is very like that, yes. Now, why would that be? Any idea why it was designed like that, rather than modular, sectional, whatever you want to call it? It's, it's stronger structure mm -hmm. for lighter weight. Right. So, okay, it just had to be like, done. Like uh, an aluminum helicopter is very light, but it's not very strong mm -hmm. either. The, mm -hmm. the amount of forces that this aircraft has to endure in the hover, like they had to go with something stronger than aluminum, mm -hmm. but still wanted to be lightweight. So they have this composite. It's really fiber of, mm -hmm. I forget what they call it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you've been involved in the engine changes, I'm guessing. Oh, yeah. Okay, a lot of people are going to be interested in this. So if we could dig into this a little further. I've got a lovely picture on the screen. I don't know if you can see. Are you on the stream? I just suppose it really matters because you'll know all this off by heart anyway. But it's almost like the, the top slash back, the top of the aircraft's been opened up. The wings have come off. And then he's craning this giant Pegasus out, which just looks really impressive. Why? I don't see. Why, why are the wings coming off? It's not obvious. It's not apparent why the wings have to come off. Actually, I sent you a picture. Uh, oh, right. Stand by. Let me from, just from a top-down view, you can see. Okay, right. Let's have a little look what we're looking at here. So, geez, look at... Now, interestingly, because you've got to come out with the engine, not just the kind of core engine, but you've got to come out with those, not the exterior no nozzles, but the kind of interior parts of the nozzles, haven't you? It's, that, that's, all, that's all part of the engine. It's enormous. Absolutely yeah. enormous engine, that is. So, okay, so those wings have come off. That Almost like we said, the back of the plane has just been ripped off, which is amazing. And it's come out a bit like a car engine in that case. It should be lifted out of the yep, engine bay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Wowzer. Right, okay. Yeah, and the impressive thing about this picture, too, is this is done on a ship while it's mm -hmm. rocking, you know. Wow. Doing, the, doing it on a ship mm -hmm. is a lot scarier i guess you'd say yeah absolutely because you've got i don't know what you know 10 tons of aeroplane jacked up on those wheezy little jacks i can see there so yeah. yeah that really is that really isn't quite impressive the crane uh, so the crane is hard fixed to the carrier by the looks of things yes on the on the hangar deck here. yeah yes. so at least you've got that and that's solid okay how often would these engines come out roughly uh the life I, I, I noticed it's one of the questions uh the life on these things is uh, 2000 hours 2000, 2000 flight hours. What does that work out on an on average operations? 2000 hours doesn't really mean anything to me. Roughly, is it every six months or every yeah, two I years? guess you say the average average sortie on, of a mission is probably about two hours. So that's a thousand missions. Um, they yeah. might fly two a day on a busy day, mm -hmm. you know, with the same aircraft. Yeah. So, Roger. They, they go. A little over a year, I think, on average. Right, yeah, right, yeah, okay. So it's, mm, okay, so it's not too bad. Um, sorry, I've completely missed the important bit with the picture, is that the wings are, apart, are together. Yeah. With that with yep. that, that, that bit of the top fuselage. How interesting. So you, so how does that work, then? Do you lift the wings up? On the yeah, crane? we crane, crane the wings off. Yeah. There's four pins yeah. that hold the wing on. Wow. And, you know, other connectors, too. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. Four big pins. Mm-hmm. And those crane, crane that off and then uh, finish disconnecting the engine because there's a lot of stuff on the wing that you can't get to and yeah. then uh, crane the engine out. Wow. So I see. So this was designed by the looks of it from concept then to, to lift this whole shoulder assembly up. And that must be a really strong shoulder assembly then because mm -hmm. is that where the strength of the wing is coming from? Is it coming from that, for lack of a better word, that kind of shoulder bit that connects them together? Yeah, yeah I want to say so. Yeah, I mean, that's it's a good foot foot and a half big yeah um, right so you, got there, you can't really see but maybe you call it a wing wing box or something i had no idea the aircraft was constructed like that so that's fascinating and obviously you, you've got a lot of services to disconnect as well haven't you your hydraulics and oh, all yeah. that stuff yeah. to disconnect what a pain in the butt that must be god aircraft mechanic right i'm well, getting a good well, idea of what you're, yeah. you're underneath the engine and disconnecting things and your skies above you disconnecting things and then mm -hmm. fuel starts Draining that on top of you and wow. get real mad. How are you? 
uh, when you're actually doing the, when you're disconnecting these services um, and or even reconnect, reconnecting them and talking them and stuff like that, uh, have you got a, a manual in your hand that you follow step by step like I do when I do uh, an engine yeah, change? Absolutely. Yeah, yes. you just follow. Here's the next step. Okay, boom. Here's the next step. Okay, boom. Okay, let's talk that this many feet, pounds, whatever, and so on. And that's the way it, to it's, do it. It's very important in aviation. Um, no matter how many times you've done something, mm -hmm. you always have the manual open. How you're always doing it by the book. Yeah. Mm. They started to go towards laptops towards mm -hmm. the end sure. while I was in. And, yeah. uh, just a natural but, placement, isn't it? So you don't have paper everywhere. Yeah, and... we just, yeah, we just had to print out mm -hmm. the section of the manual that we were working, <laughs> and then you <laughs> do your work, and then you toss yeah. it, and then, you know. Yeah, and it's all wasted, and yeah. yeah. Sucked in an engine at some point. Okay, right. So that already is really interesting information that we've learned today. Okay, Baron. Um, so, yeah, plane engine obviously that will make sense very good what was the common loadout they flew with so that's gonna be hard to say because are you gonna say it's mission specific yeah i mean it really is uh you gotta you gotta remember like 99 percent of our missions were training exercises mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. they might be flying with tanks for majority of them but in the actual when we were in iraq doing Combat missions, mm -hmm. they're not flying with tanks, you know, so it it definitely varies with whatever they're flying. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the bombs they're dropping are those little blue ones. I forget what they're mm -hmm. called in-game, but, mm -hmm. you know, the little dummy bombs. They got the dummy AIM-9. Mm -hmm. They'll do target practice. It's all about maintaining qualls for the pilots. Mm -hmm. Every so many months, they have to, you know, practice with the AIM-9. Uh, they have to practice with the teapot or... Uh, doing vertical landings, so it's all about maintaining quals, so mm -hmm. that when we do go to the theater and have to do real missions, they know what they're doing. Mantra. that's interesting, and that's one I guess major difference between you guys and kind of us in our simulator is that we never take off in a Harrier without brimming full of missiles and stuff. Because I don't know anyone that's ever loaded up. I know they put the training weapons, the training side one is in there. I don't know anyone that's ever loaded up with anything training, anything other than a full rack of AGM-65 or bombs, because it is a game at the end of the day. I know people don't like saying it, but, you know, you want to go and blow stuff up. Um, so I guess that's a major difference. But Yeah, yeah I, I love seeing people with the GBU-12s on the 2 and 6 pylons, which are the this outside yeah. ones. Like, mm -hmm. we've never carried anything other than aim nines or side runners in those yeah i believe we've just had them removed so that's interesting that they've had them and i noticed in the patch notes recently they've just had them i think that pile have had them removed because again you wouldn't really have them there because yeah. wings would snap off and, or whatever and another interesting note is uh while i was in from 03 to 08 uh teapods were exclusively on the three or five pylon i want to say it was on the five pylon mm -hmm. which is the first one on the right hand side of the wing mm -hmm. we never flew anything on the belly pylon why? Hell, we know we never had the belly pylon installed. Why is ever. that? Why is that? I I want to say it's for maintenance reasons because mm -hmm. two of our main axes to to the engine are on the underneath the aircraft, mm -hmm. and if that pylon was there, we'd have to drop the pylon just to open the pa panels to access the the engine. So I I want to say it was for maintenance times, but I've also seen pictures in the last few years that the they're flying with the mm -hmm. teapots down there on the number four now. Mm. Another theory could be, uh, since they're using the new, new T-Pods, that uh, when they configured them, they wired them through that pylon, mm -hmm. and maybe they weren't wired down there before. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, cannon plugs and mm -hmm. wires that need to go down through the pylons to mm -hmm. feed the information. I mean, we hear the same thing time and time again. We've, we've interviewed F-15 techs, F-16 techs, F-14 techs, F-18, everyone, A-10 techs, and they say always say uh, the same type of thing and that is you know what you never actually fly with the load i mean maybe it's different in in wartime but generally you never fly with the loadouts you get in dcs the big tactical loadouts and, and a lot of the reason for exactly what you said is i don't want to say laziness because that's not the right thing to say but uh it's just for maintenance reasons it's a pain in the ass to have that pylon on there you know it adds x amount of hours to operating the aircraft so you just never have it um uh, so again, what you said there, at least in your yeah, time, I say, uh, efficiency and uh, uh, as far as fully loading a Harrier, we just fly more Does jets. Yeah, you, you have four jets with you know mm. three bombs each. That that's mm. your twelve bombs. Mm -hmm. You don't need 
one jet with eight and another jet with four, you know. Mm. Yeah. Mojo. Okay, very good. Um, let's move on. Were there any major incidents that happened whilst on one of your deployments involving Harrier? Yes. <laughs> well, well, I should rephrase the question. Any incidents that you're allowed to talk about without uh, getting yourself oh, in trouble? Yeah, I can, I can talk about Send. Uh, I don't know 100%. I'll tell you the story that I've heard. Mm -hmm. uh, we were off the coast of Indonesia. We aren't supposed to be flying because there are rebels in the area and we don't want to cause any conflict, right? We don't want to mm -hmm. get the appearance that we're, hey, we're coming for you, them, and then we don't want they start conflict. But uh, for some reason, we decided we're gonna we're gonna fly an, an aircraft. And uh, the pilot was out flying. He landed for, to refuel on the on the boat. Had an F bay caution light on, mm -hmm. which you know on your caution advisor panel on the bottom right, one for the F bay, and that's where all your electronics are stored. Mm -hmm. It's on the aft bay of the aircraft. So that means there's an air something's going on with your electronics. Uh, I guess the pilot was talking to his flight lead guy, and he was like, oh, it's up to you if you want to continue flying or not. So he decided to c continue flying, and uh, eventually he ejected over the water, and mm -hmm. uh, the aircraft sunk. Uh, from what I heard, uh, at the inlet of the high press pressure compressor inside the engine mm -hmm. there's veins that open and close to restrict the airflow depending on your power as you increase the power it lets more air in and as you decrease it lets less air and mm -hmm. it helps with stall margin and uh i guess while he was at power they closed on him or no it was when he was lower on power he came down on power they stayed open and too much air came in and it flamed out the engine and he was too low to recover, so he ejected. Mm -hmm. It happened around nighttime, and the Navy didn't want to go out and put... They could put floaties on the aircraft to help it so it could re be mm -hmm. recovered later. They didn't want to do that, so it ended up sinking. Yeah. That's a shame, isn't it? And it's it's always a, a risk because you're... Um, when a Harrier is... is, is was he... Um... Did you say that he was in in close to that just in general flight when it actually went down? He, he was in a hover. I he think in, that hover. in the hover, it's such a dangerous place to be because any lack of power, even a few percent, will put you know will put you down on the ground. Uh, it's, it's it's just a very dangerous place to be. But you know, mm -hmm. it's a risky take with the aircraft. Really interesting. Okay. Well, yep. Loss of a Harrier there, but at least the pilot was all right. So. Yeah. Fine. Okay. Let's push on. Um, did they recover the Harrier? No. Well, I mean, they might have later, but while I was while we were mm. out there, no, it, it sunk. Oh, okay. They 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 probably hired a contractor mm. to go out there and take it later. So you got to spare parts. Yeah, spare parts, and you got to you know get crash examination, blah 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 blah. So yeah, fair enough. Okay, uh, how many aircrafts could you launch from the carrier in one go, and how many could it carry in general? Oops, sorry. Uh. I mean, I'd, I'd say it, it could launch all of them, uh, but in a typical Mew, uh, we'd bring six or eight. Uh, it could hold uh, a lot more than that, but mm -hmm. with all the helicopters, we're kind of the... There's less Harriers than there are any of the other helicopters. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we typically bring with six or eight, and we can send them all at the same time, you know, one by one. They just mm -hmm. single file them out. Was that the yeah. total amount you would have on realistic? Did you say six to eight? Yeah, yeah. On one jump, okay. On, but... on one deployment, we'd have sixty-eight aircraft. Roger, <clears throat> excuse me. I've got a picture of one here, kind of fully loaded with Harriers, but that doesn't. That looks That's presentation it. more. That, that looks presentation more than an actual operation, presumably. Yeah, yeah. You, there's no helicopters there. So yeah, yeah as I thought that. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Very good. <clears throat> excuse me. Um. Right, we talk about this. How long was the life service life of the engine? Two thousand hours, about a year ish. Uh, were they very, uh, were they very labor intensive to keep running? I'd say not really. Uh, every fifteen hours, five hours, we'd do a engine oil analysis. Mm -hmm. 
never really had anything come back bad from that. Mm -hmm. uh, almost every engine that I worked with lasted all 2,000 hours. It's mm -hmm. rare for something to happen that mm -hmm. you have to pull it before the 2,000 hours. Like, uh, we've had one of the turbine blades break mm -hmm. in the back of the engine, and it causes an imbalance, and that's a mm -hmm. you definitely don't want to fly that thing. Uh, I want to say we had one FOD before, which four down drug damage. Mm -hmm. um, anytime something gets sucked down the intake, it can cause a lot of damage in the engine. Mm -hmm. uh, we had that like once. Uh, yeah, not too much. Most of them make it. They they could take a, quite a beating too. Uh, oh, sure. They, so they, durable engines. Yeah, yeah. Um, some follow-up questions there. You sent the oil anal to be analyzed onshore, presumably? Yes. Any idea what they were actually on looking for? On ship, they actually had some, too. Uh, it's mm. basically just a lab. Uh, looking for oil consumption, looking for uh, metallic mm -hmm. particles in, in, in oil, mm -hmm. meaning that something is deteriorating. Uh, I want to say that's, that's pretty much it. You know, make sure it's not too burnt. Mm -hmm. Something leaking excessively. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's a real pain. That was one of the worst services we had to do, though. It really? has to be done within fifteen minutes of a bird landing, so it's it's really hot. Yeah, so it's then enough. It's, yeah, it, yeah it, it's just burning your hands mm -hmm. as you're pulling it. Mm -hmm. It's not fun. Nice. Okay, when you've lifted a engine out, so let's call it the you know the whole engine module. Did you ever? Break that module down, or was it sent it as as the, as you, you see it there to Rolls Royce or whoever for this maintenance? Uh, we do what's called a quick engine change, mm -hmm. and it's basically some of the tubing on the back, uh, some of the accessories on the the gearbox up there yeah. gets swapped over. But mm -hmm. for the most part, no, it's it's sent as a whole. So that will go to the the manufacturer, and they'll do whatever they do, you know, with the, with in, you we, know, the proper tool. In, in the Marines, we we had a. We had our own uh, fleet of engine mechanics that all they did was tear those down and rebuild them. So they weren't. We were we were what's called uh, organization level mm -hmm. yeah. level, and they were eye level. They were intermediate level. And they're shore mechanics. based, yeah. They were. Yeah, yeah, they were shore based. Uh, some came out on the ships with us. Mm -hmm. They're usually bored because they're not doing anything. <laughs> a lot of them come work with us because mm -hmm. they enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Okay. Um, a little story about uh, uh, this engine. Um, it's sadly it's gone now. We used to have an excellent piece of aviation history in England. It was called Bruntingthorpe. It was just a big Cold War airbase that no one was operating from. They were just using it for cars and stuff like that. But someone owned it, and he decided to keep all sorts of uh, Cold War paraphernalia, including just about. I remember I've got it in one of my, my videos is somewhere. Just ten old disused, you know, over hour um, Pegasus just sitting there and you can go up they're not guarded or anything you can go up to them play with them spin the wheels you know get inside them if you want and um, I just remember uh, something I won't forget unfortunately it's gone now this place but um, for people to get getting people into aviation that was just a uh, good I was just amazed by the size of these engines as you can see the picture there. Yeah, they're, they're an amazing piece of equipment mm -hmm. the ones we had they had they had the kind of rear taken off the rear kind of nozzle area taken off. I don't know how, but mm -hmm. I'm guessing it's kind of... Hmm. Very good, guys. Um, right, let's push on. Did the Harriers ever land back at the ship with unused munitions, or did they have to be jettisoned? If so, was there a specific protocol for this? So this will be in wartime, right? You'd have live munitions going out. Yeah, I mean, they they'd sometimes use live for training. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. Uh, it's... I'm trying to think back. I can't remember for sure if we ever had a bird come back with live ordnance. But I want to say, yes, they can, as long as they're within the weight limits of vertical landing. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, I want to say the balance would have to be right. Right? They, mm -hmm. they wouldn't want to try to land with an asymmetric load. Mm -hmm. But I want to say, yeah, they can. There's nothing... They're not going to crash and blow up you know i mean yes there's always yeah. that possibility but mm. okay very good um where do we get to okay what would be the proper configuration for takeoff from carrier if doing long or jump 
takeoff. I'm not sure what you're saying. Configuration. Is it talking like flap configuration and stuff like that? Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I can't say I know uh, you're either using 55 degree nozzles or 60 degree nozzles. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's all determined by the computer in the aircraft mm -hmm. because it knows what your load is. It knows your weight. It tells you what airspeed you're supposed to rotate your nozzles and what degree you're supposed to use. So you're either going to use 55 or 60. Mm -hmm. You're always going to use uh, H2O takeoff. You're always going to use stove flaps. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I, I, every pilot I know uses the stove stop on the, the nozzles, and they set it to either 55 or 60. That way you just slam it down and you're good to go. Right. Hang on. Let's go back a few steps here for idiots like me. So, so stole flaps, you said. Is that the fully down position? Yes. And that really is fully down, isn't that? That's like nearly 90. It's an amazing yeah. flap on that plane, yeah, isn't it's, it? It's, 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 yeah. Short takeoff flaps. Yep. Yeah. Right. So. so uh, so that's that. And you said there was a, a stop of some sort on the on the nozzle. Yeah, on your that? on your on your nozzle uh, slide, mm -hmm. you adjust your nozzles. Mm -hmm. At the very bottom, there's this little black uh, stop that you could adjust, and you could put that at any position you want. So you slam your nozzles down, and it's going to stop wherever you have that stop set. Do we have that in the game? I'd never heard of that. Yeah, oh, yeah I use it all okay. the time. Nozzle is it called nozzle stop? Uh, S T O stop. STO stop. Right. So. Okay. Right. Well, it's obviously something I have to go and look at because I never heard it. So, excellent. Well, this is what you get from talking to a real tech. So. Look at the you one, can see look at one of those uh, throttle quadrants. Yeah. Uh, oh. Second row, third one in. This one here, guys, or a little bit yep. left. Yeah. Okay. So, that's a real yeah, world yeah. one. What am I looking at, guys? Closest leap is the uh, nozzles. Mm -hmm. The STO is that little black thing. Mm -hmm. You see, like the holes that are in that rib. Mm -hmm. Basically, it drops into those ribs at fixed points. Yep. Yep. How do we control that in game with a key command or something? No, key, you just click and drag it. Drag it. Oh, how about that? All these years, and I didn't even know. How about that, guys? Right. You, I will say, if if you're new to it and you set it for takeoff, don't forget to. Move it away like when you come back for landing, because then mm -hmm. you won't be able to go past your still stop. Roger, how interesting. Okay, um, one question as well, from just from a noob like me. So when they're actually belting down the length of, on the deck, is the nozzle back at that point, or do they keep it at the fifty-five, sixty degree all the time? I never quite know. Oh, no, no, it's it's back until the wheels come off the deck. Right, and then you launch it forward. Good, because that's what I've been yep. doing. Yep. Right. And that's always a bit of a precarious moment, isn't it, chaps? To getting that nozzle forward in time so that you don't just whoa sink because you've got no, you're not enough lift at that point, really. You need those nozzles down, don't you? Otherwise, she just falls. Yeah. Ten degrees on your roll, and then there's a line at the end of the deck, and as soon as your nose wheel crosses that line, ah. that's when you hit it. I didn't know that. It's either. called the rotation line. Right. I think. Oh, so I'll have to redo my videos at some point because I had no idea about any of this stuff. So, very good, guys. Right. Okay, let's punch on, guys. Uh, what did we ask? What's configuration? So we've answered that, haven't we? Um, so we've done flaps, nozzle positions. What about throttle, guys? And I think we're going to come on to this. But the throttle um, position is confusing, to say the least. For, for an idiot like me, I mean, uh, uh, an F-15, right? You have between 0 and 100% throttle. Okay, makes sense. Um, this, you have 0, 80, 100, 102, 103, 107. It's like... What do you actually many use? Is it again? Is it is there a book that tells you with a certain loadout use this many RPMs or throttle percentage? Does anyone know? I I do not know if there's a procedure for your RPM. Mm -hmm. um, I do. I will say it's very temperature dependent. Mm -hmm. The hotter it is, the the worse your engines are going to perform. The colder it is, the better it's going to perform. So. You're gonna get way more thrust with lower RPMs in the cold, mm -hmm. uh, but but I am guess you know sometimes you throttle up and let's say you're topping out at 108 percent, mm -hmm. and other times you're topping out at 110 percent. That's all uh, the digital engine control unit. Mm -hmm. It's it's this computer that runs the engine. It it tells your throttle's telling it what you want, mm -hmm. and it's telling you it's delivering the engine what it can i mean interesting it's hard it, yeah it's, it's all computerized so roger well i'll I tell you that... what 
we're, we're that's coming, a big part roger we're coming up to that a bit more in into question 12 so we'll we'll talk about that because that is really interesting um but we'll, we'll wait for that so okay um next question nine is there an average thrust ratio for takeoff fully loaded from the carrier or land it's kind of what we just said but any answer to that question i i don't remember off the, it's so the engine is producing about thirty-two thousand foot pounds of thrust so Yowza. Uh, an empty air harrier is about 16,000 pounds, mm -hmm. so you're looking at, you can probably take off with, what, 14,000 pounds of fuel and mm -hmm. ordnance. Uh, but basically, I just go to the your short takeoff page, or your it, V rest page, mm -hmm. and it tells you your max short takeoff weight. And you just, as long as you're underneath that, you're good to I, short takeoff. I didn't even know that, right? So that's something to look into. Okay. Out of interest, now um, a, a, a typical fighter jet where the end, or you know, a typical non Harrier where the thrust, if you like, just comes out the back, um, there's not a great deal of loss of um, efficiency, for lack of a better word. But in the Harrier, it has to be ducted, everything's ducted, okay? Um, ducted at the rear nozzles, ducted at the front nozzles, sometimes even ducted through the wings and thing, I think. Do you get, and I understand you might not uh, know this, but do you get a lot of kind of power loss through that system um do you know no so, so uh yes there's four ducts on the aircraft there's mm -hmm. one that goes to the nose one to each wingtip and one to the tail um there's also what's called a butterfly valve on your engine that when you rotate your nozzles down i can't remember that i want to say it's past 10 degrees mm -hmm. that's when the air starts going to the ducts Mm -hmm. If you're at zero degree nozzles, there's no air going to those ducts, so mm -hmm. you're not going to lose any power whatsoever. Right. As you start to bring the nozzles down, that's when the ducts start to come into play, mm -hmm. and uh, the further nozzles come down, the more it opens and the more air it allows to flow through. So it it doesn't really cause a power loss until you're needing to use the ducts. So it's what about the of... actual um, scrapping the ducts? What about just the normal nozzles? Do they cause? Do we know if they cause power loss? Because obviously your your direction of flow of the you know of, of your gases is kind of turning ninety degrees, going through that U bend, then turning ninety degrees again. Or is that insignificant or unknown? To, to my knowledge, there's no real power loss. Mm -hmm. Your power loss is the fact that you can't put an afterburn on it. Yeah, you don't need <laughs> it in this plane. Novels, no, but, you don't need it in this plane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To my knowledge, you know, that, that's an engineering thing, though. I'm not, not too Roger, sure. Roger, that's just something I've always been really interested in about kind of efficiency of, uh, of of these nozzles. Obviously, they're needed. You know, they have to be. I mean, I, I can say, based on DCS, the fuel f flow of these things, mm -hmm. it's it's a lot higher than, you know, the 18s. Mm -hmm. It is. You could be very an afterburner. Yeah. You could be an afterburner and burning the same amount of fuel that one of these is, you know. And you're going a lot faster than 18, so uh, I guess it's probably not the best efficient. It always confused me a bit, because this one's quite... Uh, well, I, I haven't studied the Pegasus, so I don't really know, but the fan on the front is big. And so, for me, I would call that a fairly high bypass ratio turbo fan. And yeah, usually... It's about, it's about 75%, yeah. It's a lot. It's just, you know, getting off a of Boeing. And usually, generally speaking, if you go to higher bypass, you're going to get better gas mileage. But this plane... I'm a great plane, don't get me wrong. Gas mileage is terrible. I've, in, in the trials I've done, it was it was in DCS. It was it was terrible. So I don't know why it is inefficient like that. I'd love if, if the viewers have any more information on why in final output, in the amount of fuel you have to put in to get a certain amount of motion going forward for the aeroplane, why we have... It, it's probably just the age of the mm -hmm. design. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the modern Boeing engines that were, you know, yeah, they're more efficient because mm -hmm. they've more knowledgeable better made i mm -hmm. guess if if somebody went and redesigned this they could probably make it more fuel efficient roger produce the same amount of power new generation pegasus that would be pretty cool cool okay right um let's crack on guys where do we get to uh okay when volcon war did oh god when volcon war did harry stand by on small islands camouflage you're gonna have to interpret that what did you interpret that I, as it's about the, the ten number ten. Falkland, the Falkland. Oh, Falkland. The... Yeah, uh, I should okay. say that most you know most of our guys are not English that watch, so you just have to kind of read yeah. between the lines. Falkland was to Harris stand by small islands camouflaged. Well, don't watch. I, I mean, I, I'm I'm not too familiar with the Falkland. <laughs> I mean, I've heard of it. 
Uh, I know Harriers were shooting down other aircrafts mm -hmm. quite well. Uh, but I will say, that's what these things were designed for. These things were purely designed to be somewhere where you have no runways and you need to scramble aircraft and, and and use them effectively. So I would assume that's probably how they used them. You know? Roger. Um, we will be getting a Falklands map in um, DCS at some point, and so um, I'm really looking forward to studying it um, and what went on there. But obviously, yeah, so designed um, in the mid to early Cold War, I guess you'd call it, for exactly this, in case you lost your airfield. So, okay, very You've cool. misspelled Shaw Camp. I oh yeah shoe based. <laughs> oh, I don't think it's yeah, going to come stick, up. Stick the R in and see. Oh, look at that. Happens. San Carlos. Here we go. San Carlos forward operating base. So this is going to be in Falkland, and we've got. I know it's a crap picture, but you've got two Harriers and a Chinook there, uh, sitting. Um, what models of Harriers were? Forgive my ignorance, but you know what I'm like. What models of Harriers were being used in the Falklands, Auntie? Do you know? There's two models, weren't there? FRS-1, mm. and I think it was GR-1 and GR-3. I think it was GR-3, because GR it had the long noses. Yeah. That was the GR-3 thing. Yeah, they, they had to be modified for um, carrier IFF as well, if I remember rightly. Because mm. they, yeah. they, weren't, they weren't designed to be operating off. And they, they managed to get um, all the Harriers off of the Atlantic conveyor uh, a number of days before it got hit by the exit and went mm. down. But they only got one Chinook off. And right. I think that's probably the one that you see in that picture. Roger. Okay, I look forward yep. to studying that. So we're at San Carlos again. We've got three Harriers and I think it's two Sea Kings. I can't really tell very well. Mm. Cool. Yeah, three Sea Kings. But yeah. Um, yeah, they only made the one forward operating base. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. Uh, San Carlos is in because, to be this one. Because unfortunately they lost her. Um, some of their uh, gratings because it was they were still on board the ship and it got sunk. I was just looking at that. I was like, did they yeah. lay a road or are they aluminium gratings or something? It looks like they're gratings. They're, they're gratings. Oh, there's a great picture. Look at that. Are they metal? They must be metal, mustn't they? Yeah. Oh, jeez, it's undulating and they they interlock together. Right. Like uh, like Lego, basically. How interesting. Very cool, guys. I'm surprised they didn't melt them with the nozzles because you know what they're like. Maybe they even did. I'd love I think to... they actually had an effective ski ramp at the end. In all honesty, it was natural in the terrain. Roger. I remember reading there was a natural terrain jump they used to uh, get themselves out. Uh, I'll give you a fun fact. Send. The, the exhaust is actually isn't that hot. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of rainy and cold days, we'd be standing behind the jet while it's running to stay warm. Good lord. It's, it's, a very, it's a very nice place to be. Roger. It yeah. could be, can be pouring yeah. rain and you'll be 100% dry. <laughs> That's quite cool, yeah. Okay, you know what? One day we need to get a folk, you know, there's obviously plenty of Falklands veterans around. We need to get some people to start talking about um, and get some interviews going on. But that's really interesting. Right, we'll get back on topic. Um, In that picture, you can see the new Sidewinders that were supplied yep. to us just under the counter. What model is that? Do we know? Uh, so, I can't remember. All I know is that uh, America supplied us with new ones really under the counter. Mm. Cool, guys. They wanted to test them in a real war environment, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> I mean, how ideal. We got oh, some here's stuff. a box of sidewinders that you can use. Shoot some uh, skyhawks Oh, down. thank you very much. But they... if they don't work, don't blame us. No, they, they worked, auntie. They went right up those A4 skyhawk nozzles, didn't they? Yeah, 21 nil. Right. Well done, guys. Uh, we look forward to looking into that, but we must carry on for today. So the answer is, when did... Did they? Yes, they did. They sat on uh, FOB San Carlos, I've learned. Whether they camouflage, almost certainly. When not being used, they would have had a net yeah, on them, yeah. you know, and, and guys like that. But great piece of information there. Okay, guys, let's go on to question 11. Is the um, F-35 Bravo a suitable successor to the Harriet? This is obviously in your, you know, view. It's more expensive, thus less units can be fielded. Also higher maintenance costs, probably. Less range. Any views on that? I, I think it's an, I think it's absolutely a great successor. Um, it's super. It's faster. Supersonic could do the same thing. It still be operated out of FOB. Uh, it's definitely doesn't have less range. From what I've read, it's it's way farther range than the Harrier had. Um, maintenance cost. I mean, it. I don't I actually. I couldn't tell you if it's more or less because the Harrier maintenance cost was pretty high. Roger. Yeah. But I, I, I think it's a great machine. Uh, I was worried when I first saw, you know, the fan that opens and mm -hmm. 
all that's like oh, more moving parts is mm-hmm. you know disasters mm-hmm. for maintenance but you know this day and age i guess engineering is a lot better so maybe it isn't roger um i remember my um before my generation but when my brother was around my older brother was around when the f15 came out and when the f15 came out everyone hated it it's called the hanger queen or hanger bird i've forgotten and um always breaking down you know the costs back then of a 15 compared to probably an f4 phantom was probably the mainstay at that point you know the previous generation hated this new complicated plane come that always broke down and it was really expensive and stuff and then obviously my generation came along and we the f-15 was the mainstay and we we loved that and now the new ones coming out the raptor the next generation and the lightning and stuff like that we were like oh no we don't like that but again in 20 years time when the next generation of of plane lovers comes along that will be the standard and they'll be moaning about the sixth generation fighters that's how it's always been and Mm -hmm. and always will be um so it's just how it is right uh, next one, really interesting one. In DCS, the Harrier engine reaches 116% RPM with water when the nozzles are down, but only 111% when they are aft, brackets combat power. Why is the RPM limited at full aft, and is it in the real thing like that? Do we know? Well, I can tell you two things. Uh, one, I'm pretty sure you know ambient temperature and all that is that in the game as far as mm-hmm. entry performance goes mm-hmm. I, I think altitude is you know the higher you go the less mm-hmm. performance you get but um it really has to do with outside temperature the colder the air is the more dense it is the more uh compression compression you get so the bigger bang you get mm-hmm. uh the hotter it is the thinner it already is uh so you're gonna get more rpms on cold days than you are on hot days um as far as nozzles back and da- or down your water is not flowing when your nozzles are back so if you turn your water switch mm-hmm. on you hear you hear a slight increase in rpm mm-hmm. and i think that's just the computer you know saying oh yeah we're in takeoff mode um but you're actually not pumping any water until you put the nozzles down and you throttle up the engine and again i think the computer determines when the not when the water flows that's when you're getting the boost in power right because there's water does two things it cools the engine but it also makes the air more dense being mm-hmm. pushed out of the engine. And, and the way a thrust engine works is you're pushing air out of the engine and you have opposite force on the aircraft, which is pushing you that direction. Mm-hmm. You have more dense air coming out. It has more thrust pushing your aircraft the other direction. Mm-hmm. So um, you're definitely going to get way more RPMs when the water is actually flowing. And I, I don't want to say they don't want the water flowing when your nozzles are back because they don't want you to actually leave the water on and then you can't vertically land because mm-hmm. you have no water. So, right. The water's the water's sole purpose is takeoff and landing. Right. I was unaware of that. Um, maybe we should even take a step back and you know because the layman watching this video is talking, why are they talking about 116 percent? Doesn't that defy the idea of percent? And it's it's a fair question. If the engine goes to 100 percent, sorry, 116 percent, what is 100 percent? You know, why does it go above 100 percent? What's your explanation of that? I'm I'm not sure. <laughs> can give you a, a, a solid answer on that. Um, I know the uh, current, I'm working with 46 engines right now and they're, they do the same thing. We go up to like 106% on those. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, 100% must be a metric. It must be a, a certain point. Like, uh, you know, that's the maximum you can go for a certain amount of time. You know, it must, must be a, a standard point. But I've always been confused how you can go. I mean, it's, it's, it's some other planes, like you well, said. Well, I mean, with, with these, you can you could go 102.5 for unlimited. Like, really? You you have no, yeah, so that, that's your max continuous is 102.5. Okay. But, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I, it might have to do with, you know, the first generation of the engine went to 100%. Mm. But as they started improving it and making it better, mm. it the RPMs got higher and higher and higher. That's a possibility. Oh, and we should say as well, for the layman's point of view, these big uh, percentages, 116% and stuff like that, these aren't really sustainable, are they? That you can only go with, uh, on them depending on 
all sorts of other conditions but you know then you couldn't just leave the engine running like that for a long time you know you'd have to watch your temperatures which would rise and you'd have to back off and would that be with the backing i've always wanted to know the backing off of the engine once it got too hot once the jpt got too hot is that done automatically in the real aircraft or does the pilot have to sit and watch that figure and throttle necessarily uh accordingly? I, I actually don't know the answer to that uh i'd have to read the natos manual mm -hmm. uh you're talking about like when you when you go past the 15 seconds and then it like puts a reduces the thrust of your engine. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Yeah, that's I, exactly right. yeah. I'm guessing that's yeah. I'm guessing that's the computer taking over, saying, "Oh, you probably damaged the mm -hmm. engine, so we're gonna limit your capabilities so that we don't damage it any further." Mm -hmm. That that might be actual. Because what I noticed is when in the first kind of iteration of the Harrier in DCS, when it first came out, you could, I, I may not be 100% right here, but I think you could almost burn your engine out, couldn't you guys, from, from flying too much power. And then it was changed a few months ago, and now it backs off automatically. And it's very, I haven't managed to damage a Harrier engine since. So I figure they've added some. I was doing some tests earlier today, and I actually caught it on fire. Oh, really? But, yeah. Well, so there's two main switches. If you want to, override mm. control of the engine on your throttle there is manual fuel which basically is c taking off the fuel control mm -hmm. so you're just saying whatever throttle i put this at i just want to be dumping fuel mm -hmm. and then above that you have another switch that's your jpt limiter mm -hmm. that's, that's your jet pipe temp limiter mm -hmm. if you turn that off and you have your manual fuel on i mean mm -hmm. you could cook that engine you could just really? max power and you'll over temp it real fast but there'll be nothing that forces you to come down on power or mm. you yeah until okay. you destroy that but it, it's not really modeled that great it caught fire and i was able to continue flying <laughs> well, fire, so. yeah. Yeah. yeah that's just how the how the game engine works but yeah interesting i'd love to study this plane a bit more if i know very little about it but okay anyone got interesting any story of it mm -hmm. uh after we do an engine change we have to run the engine in manual fuel mm -hmm. and uh we had a problem once where it was dumping fuel at start in manual f manual fuel. It was dumping fuel before he had it in the idle position, and uh, it was a pretty big fireball. The engine was on fire. Wow. Manual fuel is is no joke. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to use it in, in uh, emergencies only, obviously. No joke. And when we were talking about the water, it's literally just some water being kind of atomized and sprayed into the inlet. Is that what's happening? It, no, it's it's going into the into the combustion right behind the fuel oh really oh, and it's uh it's special water it's demineralized water we actually have a, mm -hmm. a counter that counts how many parts per million of mm -hmm. minerals are in it and it has to be below like six parts per million so those minerals would damage the end rust the engine damage the engine do something like that presumably yes yes and I, I saw that's a question, and I have a picture for you when we get there Roger that's interesting because in again in a car you spray it in you know right at the beginning uh, when you're doing whatever water methanol, so this you're actually putting into just pre was it pre combustion did you say or post combustion? Uh, post combustion. Hmm. How interesting. Okay. Right. Very good. Um. Because that was quite. Oh, what, sorry. One more thing. In DTS, the rear big main nozzles they glow red orange hot in the game when you get you know when they're running hard. Do they glow in real life? Absolutely. Ah. It is one of the best things to watch. On the when you're on a ship and the mm -hmm. Harrier's landing six feet in front of you, mm -hmm. and you're looking up at night and you just see those big glowing nozzles. It's it's pretty impressive. Right, don't touch that nozzle. Yeah, very good. Is it true uh, everyone in the Marines goes through some basic training? Not sure what that means. Does it mean flight training or? Is it the same basic training? Through the same. Sorry, I missed that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So so basically in the Marines, yeah. Uh, no matter what your job is, you, everyone goes to the same boot camp. Mm -hmm. Twelve weeks. Uh, the, the Marine Corps' motto is, or you know, not motto, but idea is, everyone's a rifleman first. Mm -hmm. So even when we're in Iraq and we're we're maintainers, we're carrying around rifles. We're able to fight if you know they were to come storm mm -hmm. the base. Uh, so yeah, all Marines go through the same boot boot camp. Uh, the difference is after boot camp is when we do our combat training. Infantry go do their infantry combat training, and then everyone else does their it's a little dumbed down, basically half of infantry training. We learn how to shoot or uh, 
yeah, play with the 50 cals, mm. do the AT rockets, and basic nav and combat maneuvers. Yeah, it's very basic. How does sit? How does it? Sorry, compare to the real thing? Obviously, you're not a pilot, but you can still answer the question in several ways. I will say, so I I, I found DCS early, earlier this year, and uh, it was the Harrier it was the thing that sold mm-hmm. me on it. Right, mm-hmm. so I was like, all right, yeah. I, I've always been big in the the flight sims. I played the IL two back in the day, mm-hmm. uh, Falcon four point I was like, man, all right, I'm gonna buy it, and I jump in. And I was like, I got nostalgia. It was. Mm-hmm. The best thing, hopping in that thing and starting it up. I, I thought it was great. Like, I, I remember to start sequence by myself, mm-hmm, and it wow. worked, <laughs> and it was it was quite awesome. So, it's it's very satisfying. But as I'm flying it, and I learn, you know, it's it's quite buggy. There's things that <sighs> fall short. It's the, yeah. The biggest thing for me, the the one thing that really, and I, I even posted on their forums. Uh, as soon as I turn the bats switch on, I want the master caution and warning f- lights flashing. I want all the lights to come on because mm. we don't turn those lights off. Like you don't sit there and turn them off. I know they only come on when you start the engine, and then that's that's not the way it is. As soon as you turn the bats on, you know those lights are flashing. That's the one thing. I, it's like, and, um, <sighs> it's a shame. Really so we, we love the Harrier. It looks one of the best in DCS. Sounds one of the best in DCS. It flies one of the best in DCS. But it's, it's just so annoying. And, and the Mirage isn't this bad in terms of bugginess. But the Harrier's always, always been problematic. It's a real shame. But anyway, it's there. And we still advertise it as best we can. Right, let's push on, shall we? Um, did you ever use parts that have come from the GR9s? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say no. Uh, in fact, I only remember one time flying with the GR9s. Mm-hmm. Uh, they came down to Yuma and were there for a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, we f- they flew missions together, but yeah. Uh, as far as sharing parts, no. There, were, there definitely is rules and procedures of mm-hmm. traceability of where the parts need to come from and right. that they need to be proper for your actual aircraft. Right. Okay. So it's not like again, we're a car. If a, if a particular, you know, model of Nissan has the same instrument cluster as another model of Nissan, then you can just grab it off eBay or whatever, and it will fit and work. But you weren't allowed to do that. You need proper traceability. Right. Okay. That's okay. That absolutely makes sense. Um, well, we sold all our Harriers to the United States Marines for about one point two million each. Wow, that's dirt cheap. So yeah, later, later, I guess all the they, parts they part them out, yeah. And then, then they, I guess they could be used, yeah. And they were all fully operational when they went as well. That was a stipulation that we made. Mm-hmm. So. I wasn't aware of that, Auntie. When was that roughly? That's that's cheap. Uh, well, I can't remember. When they were finally disbanded. Roger. Okay, fair enough, guys. Right, let's push on. Uh, is there a difference for the aircraft if it's VTOL or STOL? Uh, I know load limit will be different, but which is which is better for the aircraft? Also, do you think the also do you think the US Harrier is more sexy than a British Harrier? I love flying the sexy Harrier from Misha. Again, not an English, you know, guy. Do you understand the question to begin with? Yeah, I think so. Uh... I was talking about the the stress for the aircraft and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, so vertical is definitely going to be more stress on the airframe. Uh, uh, short landing is riskier for you know landing gear, I guess, but and tires, pilots break a lot of tires. But I want to say uh, vertical landing is definitely more stress on the airframe, and typically it's only done on the ship. Uh, when when we're flying on land, they're just doing short landings mm-hmm. with sixty degree nozzles and just coming slow. And I yes, I do think the U.S. Harrier it looks better than the the GR9. <laughs> <laughs> the wrong answer. Um, did you think you said the VTOL uh, method was more um, stress on the airframe? Did you mean the engine rather than the airframe, or did you mean to say that? Uh, no, no, from what I understand, uh, and it's part of the the design of the wings mm-hmm. why they're angled down like that mm-hmm. is just because when it's in a hover and you have like maybe ordnance or maybe not even ordnance but just fuel in the wings like the the amount of force that is being put on them is 
pretty high. There's no lift generated in the wings, so mm -hmm. oh, I all see. the not Just supported at all. On the ground, you got wheels, haven't you? Yeah. I didn't think about that. So right, so when you're on a now that's interesting. So when you're in a hover, you've got unsupported wings, and you've obviously got this kind of special wing section here that, as far as I'm aware, nothing else uses. And if you've got bombs and stuff, then the wings no longer have any support, so they're being essentially torn off the plane. I never thought of that before. Mm -hmm. How interesting. Right. So in that case, it would be better to have a, a, a stall landing where they're being held up by the by the lift. Hmm. And again, nothing. Another massive thing learnt there. Okay, uh, you've already answered this question for number 17. Um, how hard is it to remove a Pegasus compared to an F-15-16? Um, do you want to skip over that one? That was my question anyway. Uh, I, I guess I could add a little more. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of guys that I worked with are kind of jealous of like the F-18 guys because they can do an engine change in like 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, the difference is with the newer jets, like it's all computerized. And I, I don't know if you're into cars, you know, mm -hmm. you can plug in a code reader and see what's wrong with the vehicle mm -hmm. with the harrier there was none of that like it's all troubleshooting it's all hard maintenance mm -hmm. and i i think it makes better mechanics Agreed. in my opinion mm -hmm. yeah Roger. so so i i i'd like to work on the harrier versus like an 18 like i'm still a mechanic so actually i'm not going to weigh in because i've got an f-15 tech to do to do to do afterwards <laughs> i have no i have no opinion uh, very good. 18. What uh, was your most memorable maintenance issue involving the AVAB, either from battle damage or from a pilot not understanding your plane as well as they thought they did? So a guy over revving the engine, overheating the engine, a guy slamming on the deck too hard, or anything that gave you a headache? No. Were they all very good? Think most memorable maintenance issue. Uh... It, it's a silly one. Uh, we had a commanding officer who all our pilots or all our officers are pilots in the in the in the squadron. Mm -hmm. While they're not flying, they have other duties. Like they'll be in charge of our maintenance shop or XO CO. So our CO is flying, and apparently he has an AMP license, which is our airframe and power plants license that the U.S. uses to say you're qualified to work on aircraft so he's a certified aircraft maintenance person mm -hmm. who's a pilot on the aviab uh and he was he was out flying and i guess he, he was feeling weird vibrations and he came landed and he told us i would check this and i would check this and, and he d doesn't know what the hell he's talking about mm -hmm. it's like these things unrelated it's this but he's a CO, he's in charge, so you have to be mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, absolutely, yes sir. Mm -hmm. And with the document that we've checked these and things. and mm -hmm. uh, he, I think he's, he's, he said, uh, check to see if the nozzles are loose. You know, it's like, they can't just come loose. Like, mm -hmm. There's like 50 bolts in the fucking thing. Mm -hmm. Excuse my language. Uh, it, it was quite amusing. That, Did you ever find the problem? Uh, I think that's the bird that... Uh, we found a blade missing in the turbine <laughs> section. Yeah, <laughs> that'll be it then. All right. Okay. Very good. Um, uh, did the water injection system ever cause rust issues? Yes. Though not not while I was in. Uh, mm -hmm. This is actually a picture that I was shared a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll link it to you. Oh, geez. This is so my car. This is looking in the exhaust of the engine. Wow. You're looking at blades. Those are supposed to go all the way to the end of the engine. Uh, uh, here, you know, like to the end of the wall there. Mm -hmm. So what I heard was this squadron, uh, their water cart that had the the gauge that tells you how many parts per million was mm -hmm. in it, mm -hmm. it was broken. Okay. And they were still using it. So they, it determined that... Uh, they were not using distilled water, and this is what happened to their engine. Wow! So that is that is some serious damage. That that is scary if I was flying that thing. Yeah, right. Well, that wouldn't fly, would it? <laughs> it would just, just, no, it probably just wouldn't break apart. Wow! So, and I guess the other thing is, you're going to be however well you fly, you're going to be sucking up some sea air as well. Uh, I guess it's the same with any naval aircraft, really. Um, some salt water. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think that's question 20. Oh, oh right. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, sorry, yeah, exactly the same thing. Well, what uh, Was air, salt air corrosion ever a problem when at sea? Uh, it, it absolutely is a problem. And uh, the way we combat that is before the engine shuts down at the end of the day, like, if the aircraft has multiple flights, they'll do it at the, after the last flight. Um, before they shut down, while the engine is turning, we have a big garden hose. And we hose down the whole intake and all throughout the engine. Mm -hmm. So it washes out all the salt. And it's obviously washed with non-salt water. So, And then after that's rinsed, then they can shut down, and then it's good to go. Roger. So you'd have an anti, what do you call it, an anti-corrosion regime or something then? Yep. Yep. It's a water rinse. Roger. Okay. Very good. Um... Next question. In DCS, we have a new T-Bolt upgrade. So we've gone from the Generation 1 to the Generation 4 T-Bolt. When these upgrades appeared in real life, they were plug and play. Sorry. Were they plug and play, or did the aircraft electric systems need to be reprogrammed slash rewired? So this definitely happened after my time in, so I don't know. But I could speculate, mm -hmm. especially as, as I was talking uh, before, we never flew with the T-Pods on the center pylon, on the pylon 4. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I see that they are flying them there. So I'm betting that when they did have to upgrade the system, because I, I guess that's the answer, yes. I bet they did have to do a lot of system updates and uh, wiring changes. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that did probably come with the, the center pylon wiring. Mm -hmm. And that's why they fly the T-Pods on there now. Gotcha. Makes sense. Okay, next question is mine, wing damage. So in DTS, you can do a big, you know, a high G maneuver and you very easily snap your wings off. They literally just fold up and snap off, which I'm sure is perfectly realistic. Now, obviously, you know, real pilots aren't stupid enough to go and do something like that. But did you, and I know this wasn't your job per se, but did you see fatiguing uh, from when those wings, especially specific to this section that we've got here, did you see fatiguing of metal fatiguing of the wings, cracks, stuff like that? No, I never saw anything like that. Hmm. Um, I do have non-related wing damage. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the parking brakes on the Harrier have to be hand pumped. It's a it's air pressure, and it just slowly bleeds as it's holding the brakes. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> someone didn't pump the brakes one time, and. Uh, they pulled the trucks away, and the aircraft went rolling down the hill, and its wing slammed into a, a light cart and put a huge gash in the wing, and it was not a good day. Roger. Did you have to replace the whole wing section or repair, repair it, or what happened? I believe they replaced the wing, yeah. Okay. Because, yeah, okay. Very good. Um, INS alignment. In game, we have the option to have the Harrier pre aligned by the ground crew. Is this true to real life? Uh, this is also something I do not know. Hmm. Okay. I, I do know uh, on our airfield we have what's called the compass rows, and they would take the aircraft out the compass rows mm -hmm. and calibrate mm -hmm. something with the INS out there. But other than that, I do not know. I'll jump. So it's going to be someone else's job at the end of the day, but fair enough. Um, okay, guys. Uh, that's the end of the um, official questions. I know we're very interesting. Anyone, any GR guys? I'm not sure who we got around. Anyone got any ad hoc questions? Or Baron? I have a couple stories I can tell. But... Send. Send the stories. Uh, one of the biggest, other than that, one pilot who uh, flew the aircraft with the warning light. Uh, we had another pilot who was doing rocket training at night. Ooh. So he was flying NVGs, shooting rockets, and for some reason he didn't look away from the rocket blast <laughs> and kind of minded himself enough that his aircraft actually touched the ground Jeez. as he was flying. That was a he close came, escape. He, he, yeah, he came back and he had tree branches in his belly and it was a mess. I, that, I don't know how he managed, but I was, these things are pretty durable. Like, 
Yeah. Their tree branches inside the belly of their aircraft, and it flew back. And that's that's that really is quite amazing. And it's something again, obviously in game you can't blind yourself per se, but I never thought that looking at something that bright would actually blind you. I would thought you know that the NVGs would be smart enough not to just blind him. Uh, but that's interesting. Or I wonder. I don't know. Interesting. Okay. okay. That's interesting. It's 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 kind of like uh, with the FLIR. I mean. When I turn that thing on and you look at that fire, like it, it's blinding if, unless you turn down your gain. So it has to do with, you know, if you're set up for that bright to begin with, then it won't mm -hmm. be blinding. But if you're, if it's pretty dark out and you're not having bright lights and then the bright light appears, mm -hmm. it's really bright. Okay, I guess that, got, that, guess that does kind of make sense, doesn't it? Wowza. Right. So T-Pod, sorry, not T-Pod, uh, MVGs don't look at the rockets, guys. That's something we've yeah. all learned today. Okay. Uh, another fun fact is uh, the Harrier pilot maintainer uh, relationship mm -hmm. was actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, we, I, I may have partaked in one event where uh, somebody was really upset at this pilot. The pilot upset him somehow. So the way to get back at him was to disconnect one of the connectors inside of the main landing gear, mm -hmm. which would prevent the engine from starting. <laughs> so, so he'd go out to do his mission, try to start the aircraft, and it won't start. And then we, we have to be like, oh, we have to troubleshoot it. I oh, guess you can't fly your mission. So I think the pilots kind of knew it, this is a yeah. thing that was going on way before I even got there. Yeah. It's kind of a thing with the pilots and maintainers. You don't mess with your maintainers it's, and piss them off. It's good, though. You have to have... You have to have you know bilateral respect and i always think the ground crew should have a way of you know within reason obviously getting a bit back yeah. at the pilots because if the pilot becomes a complete knobhead then the whole thing breaks down so yeah absolutely i think that's a good thing within reason obviously it's within safety yeah. boundaries right yeah you know engine that starting is better than yeah. engine stopping in yeah, mid-flight yeah, yeah. De yeah detour yeah, a few uh... bolts and <laughs> you don't <want> that. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's how it's supposed to work but it didn't always work like that Roger. Mad Eyes, um, now, uh, I know it's not your interview, but do you want to just give us a kind of 30 seconds of your uh, experience? Oh, Jesus. Uh, can do. Send. Uh, I, I joined the RAF in 1988. I was posted on to 233 OCU, Harrier OCU. The OCU basically trains pilots to convert to Harriers from other aircraft. Mm -hmm. uh, I was there through the GR3, T4, GR5, GR7, GR9, T10. Uh, so all the, all the upgrades right to GR9. Uh, I went on my fittest course to go from mechanic to technician in about 98 and was posted back to the Harrier uh, maintenance flight, basically uh, doing the the more in-depth servicing, not major servicing, but you know, stripping them down to the bare metal, checking mm -hmm. for cracks, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Did that for a year, then went back on the squadron. Uh, was on the, the OCU again, which was now 20R Squadron. They got rid of the OCU, became 20 Squadron. Uh, till 2002, uh, I went down the Falklands for the second time, uh, VC Tens and Trace, I was in the Falklands. Mm -hmm. And then I was posted to Cyprus for seven years on VAS, which is basically just handing all the visiting aircraft that come in, uh, various bits and bobs. Quite easy, living in the Sunshine Island. Uh, and that was it, basically. Uh, I had 10 flights in a Harrier wow. uh, from T4 up to T10. Fire, doing various things, firing uh, SNEB rockets, uh, doing air displays, various bits and bobs, all fantastic. Okay. Uh, and love it, love the Harrier. As soon as it came out, I bought it. It was like, as the guy said, it's like you know, sitting in your office, mm -hmm. jumping in there. Uh, it was brilliant. Uh, one of the questions you asked about the, the INAS, uh, we did in the RAF get the, the guys to align the aircraft. Initially, it was just avionics guys would go out and do it. Uh, and then me asked the question, well, why can't we do that as well? Because the avionics guys do nothing all day, but go out for 10 minutes and then come back in. Mm -hmm. And they went, all right. And they taught all the RAF ground crew to then align the aircraft from, from my suggestion. So they probably hit me quite a lot. Famous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's me. All right. You'll have to send me a paragraph so we can interview you as well. Because it sounds like you've got some good old stories that we can talk about. Uh, is there any legal ramifications? Um... <laughs> Uh, we'll, figure, we'll figure that out we'll figure that in, out in the small print right guys um, any other questions because we've got Baron on um, any questions while we've got Super Baron yeah. on yeah, I was actually going to ask a question sorry sorry mm -hmm. Typher 
Uh, it's basically I, I've probably heard it before. It's the difference between the the the, the ordnance they carry. Obviously, the RAF Harry, as many of you know, we have uh, Laos mounted on the outrigger pylons. The USAF, the USMC, sorry, do not use outrigger pylons. Is there any particular reason? Because obviously they're reducing their amount of, of payload they can carry. And if you combine that, the fact they don't use a ski jump, which also reduces the payload they can carry, why is there any idea why they went down that line? Yeah, I'm not too sure. I've seen it once. I, we do have them, so they can use them. I, I don't know the reasoning that they don't. Um, I've, I have seen it once. Uh, other than that, yeah, I had no explanation for you. Okay. Because always it comes as standard, basically. That's what. That's all they come with. I didn't realize, guys. That's fascinating. No idea. I, I yeah, did a guy. Uh, in one of the, he reckoned one of the reasons the ski jump was because you wanted more helicopter storage at the end oh, of the deck. Right. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's my theory on that one. Uh, I was in the RAF. You all had. Uh, did all your aircraft have radars or? No, none. None of our aircraft. None of the the the, the second generation had uh, radar. The only radar aircraft were the FRS ones and Navy jets because they were fleet defense. Uh, that yeah. was a purely ground attack. That's definitely one thing I was looking forward to in DCS if, mm -hmm. if they get the radar mm -hmm. AV8s in there too. Mm -hmm. Then you could have you could have uh, AIM 120s on them. Yeah. Weren't they sure. supposed to be doing that? Yeah, they're talking about it, but I guess it's like far down on there. Plan. They said they're waiting for the F-18 radar to be completed before they take, undertake it. Sorry, Is it the same system? In game or real life? I missed, I missed that, guys. Are we talking about now? In game. Oh, right. Okay. Right. Because the, the Marines fly the, the AV-8 Harrier 2 Plus, which is a radar variant, and then the night attack, mm -hmm. which has the DMT. And with the, with the radar variant, we can carry a, you know, uh, aim 120s and aim 9s and they're actually pretty good at dogfighting yeah mm, wicked that's cool cool okay um any other questions for baron while we've got him on guys yeah i do have one um there's a quite a famous video out there now of uh when the u.s harriers landing with its nose gear take um out of action um is that something you have uh, prepared for in service, or was that sort of a quick, oh crap, we need to do something situation? Do you know? Uh, you talk about the one on the ship. So that, that's yeah. an impressive. That's an impressive landing job by that pilot. I will say, I see some pilots with all the landing gear have terrible landings. Uh, yeah, that that's uh, I forget to call it. It's something like the, the horse dolly or something. I can't remember exactly the horse seat or something, but it, it's designed. To rest the nose on the deck in case the landing gear does not come down. But in my four years of working on them, I never had a aircraft with the gear that wouldn't come down. Was that specifically designed for that purpose? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Roger. If you if you search um, do a YouTube um, do a Google search, you can find an air you, you know an, a shore based example, and he lands on a bunch of mattresses, bed mattresses. <laughs> just, and they all get stuck up in the intake. Ah, just, <laughs> I just, 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 I've never seen that before. That's hilarious. Jeez, very good, guys. Um, anything else, chaps? Do you know if they ever found out what was wrong with that nose leg? What was wrong with what? The the nose leg, because the nose leg on a Harrier is actually kept up by the doors. It's the the doors hmm. that hold it. Uh, Andy's got a blowdown system which uses a nitrogen bottle which, which blasts all the hydraulic oil out and fires nitrogen at the system. So I'm just wondering how the legs, because the, the legs, well, they've, there's actually, they used to have a, a, a 3G valve or something in, which used to allow the leg to droop onto the doors to prevent damage to the system. So the leg would actually move up and down under G. So I'm wondering why it didn't come down. The, I wondered if he knew. The doors went open. Yeah, I had no idea. Was it just the doors? Well, well, the doors fold the leg up, so I guess that's why. Doors went open, no, so... I don't know, a catch or a lock or whatever. I don't know. God knows. Cool, guys. Okay, guys. Um, so, first of all, that's me learning a lot. I just never knew much about the Harry. I've always wanted to learn about it, but, if, you know, something else always gets in the way, and I'm basically hopeless. But that's a great interview. I've learned a lot, and that's really reignited my Harriet interest, which is great. Um, I think that's it. Thank you, Baron, for coming along and sharing your stories and doing that, and go and play some serious Harriet, and play with us as well on our public games and stuff and that'd be awesome yeah, yeah it was fun uh yeah i've been i've been fine on the stone butter so oh, wicked. Uh, 
Oh, I thought I'd see you in in there full times, but I'm always yeah. teaching in there. So yeah, right. I've, I've spied in a few uh, interviews so far. So. Yeah, wicked. Okay, guys and Baron, thank you very much. I've got to go and get on with um, uh, gardening now, so a little bit less sexy. But uh, thank you very much, and I'll see you guys later. Yeah, thank you. See you guys. Bye.